Ja. A very good afternoon and welcome to the Begiesel with one of its favorite sons, Andy Goldberger, carrying the camera down on a beautiful day yesterday, which is uh, rather different to what we have today, particularly in terms of the winds. Andy Goldberger expressing his passion and enthusiasm for the famous Bergiesel, where the calculation line is at 120 meters. And of course, this is where Andy Goldberger was really most successful on the Bergiesel in the Fiaschanza, which of course he ended up winning on more than one occasion. Building up the speed here to over 90 kilometers and in today's new race suits accelerating to land at something like 115 kilometers and then this unique upslope similar to Oslo but much steeper as an outrun and a little bit also like uh, Wiesler but a, a bigger hill altogether. Yeah, it felt a uh, good, good start in the hill today and uh, then it's easy to uh, improve during each jump and uh, I was getting a uh, good confidence and then it's uh, got the also maybe a bit lucky so yeah, it's fun to be uh, on the top. And as Fanamel who's very much found his form in Garmisch and bring it also through to Innsbruck. Es wird auf alle Fälle einmal ganz spannend werden. Ich werde mein Bestes geben, so wie jedes Mal. Und ja, er ist in einer sehr guten Verfassung. Also von dem her, ja, freue ich mich schon mehr auf morgen und spannend wird es. Ja. Das kann ich jetzt nicht, nicht beeinflussen, ob er mehr Erfahrung hat wie ich. Aber wenn ich so locker bleibe, wie ich bis jetzt war, dann wird der Sprung auch hinhauen und dann wird das Ergebnis auch passen. Thomas Dietard, who's been an absolute uh, sensation since being brought into the World Cup. Ja, es war schon wichtig, die zwei Sprünge gut zu machen. Dann äh, ist äh, auch wirklich die Gelegenheit da, die Qualifikation auszulassen. Weil äh, das Training muss sein und auch diese Anhaltspunkte, gerade hier, wo jetzt die Spur anders ist als noch in Oberstdorf und Garmisch, äh, geht es anders auf den Tisch zu und das hat recht automatisch schon funktioniert. Und das sind die Dinge, die ich heute spüren wollte. Voll heiß machen kann ich dann morgen noch und von dem her ja, mache ich jetzt Beine lang und entspanne mich. Ja, Simon Amman, very confident that even though he lost the lead in Garmisch after his victory in Oberstdorf, that this is something that he can actually uh, bring back here in uh, Innsbruck. Although uh, this is a hill he's uh, never won. I'm happy. I'm taking new steps uh, towards better and better jumping. Still, it's not perfect, but uh, that's not the goal yet either. Trying to take small steps and hopefully we can see even better jumps tomorrow. I have uh, done a hell of a lot of work this summer. I never trained so much in my life. Uh, so it's a bit annoying to not be among the top. But then again, uh, I have made no jumps this summer. I started on snow uh, right before Lillame. So uh, the only jumps I have is kind of competition jumps. So I have to use every competition jump I have to train. And that's a bit hard. And also when you see that you're not fast enough with the legs and the technique is not 100% perfect. It's a bit tough when you were one of the best athletes here last year. Yeah, and I have to say that uh, Anders Jakobsen certainly deserves a change of good fortune. Well, one of the wonderful factors about the Bergiesel is this amphitheater and the noise that rings around here, particularly if you're an Austrian ski jumper. The Austrians who've dominated the Bergiesel for the last five seasons. A very good afternoon to you. I'm David Goldstrom and thank you for your company. As you probably gathered from some of those uh, earlier sound bites, uh, uh, Anders Fanamel uh, with uh, some confidence at the moment to really keep his uh, rejuvenated form in Garmisch running through Innsbruck here 
and uh, Thomas Dietard as excited as ever. He knows he's in very good shape and uh, has really been looking forward to coming here to uh, not his original part of Austria, but actually to uh, where he's been training with the second group under Florian Diegel. Well, oh, for Dietard, it's been a sensational season, but when you imagine that we're just talking about a few days before Christmas, when he was brought into the team... Und ich kann mich noch ganz genau erinnern, da, hat, da ist er noch mehr als letzter da oben gestanden und wie, der, wie er weggefahren ist und wie er unten gelandet ist, hat man die Menschenmenge dann aufgeklärt. Dietard, uh, remembering that uh, he was a test jumper in Bishopshoven and remembering what that was like to uh, be watching all the stars of the sport and his teammates at that particular time. Thomas ist natürlich, hat den Spitznamen Gummiball ein bisschen, so, weil er wirklich extrem spritzig und schnellkräftig ist. Es ist natürlich wichtig, dass man die Kraft, was man hat und diese Spritzigkeit, dass man so viel wie möglich auf den Schanzentisch hinkriegt, das ist natürlich ein bisschen schwieriger. Und das gelingt jetzt an Thomas momentan sehr gut. Also er pfeffert alles hin von seiner Energie, was er hat und das äh, ist sehr gut und das ist zum Glück auch momentan so weit. Dietart, an amazing start in uh, Oversdorf, but an even better yeah, result on New Year's Day. Es ist zwar noch ein bisschen ungewohnt, dass auf einmal alle Leute was von dir wollen, aber zur Zeit I really gehen didn't expect that at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I actually also enjoy being the uh, center of attention. Although I'm not uh, used to that fact, of course, everybody wants something from me now, but I think I'm handling it okay. Cooler Typ and yeah, he wants it. He had Thomas Morgenstein as media profi on his side, and he must have I think he's now up to the coaches uh, to be there for him. There are so many things happening around him, but he's a cool guy and. He uh, has Thomas Morgenstern as a media professional around him on his side. He'll help him how to uh, behave so that all of this works out. This is exceptional that kind of you managed to be on the spot at this point of the season coming from nowhere. But if you look back, kind of, then I know that they have been, for example, they had a training camp in uh, Norway and I talked with my coaches when the B team of Austria was there and then there was one of those coaches said that this Dietard, he's jumping, he's jumping good. He has uh, quite high potential, I think. And that was before anybody, other noti anybody else noticed. So this is, has been a process, of course. And then he comes to the Four Hills and kind of by luck or, you know, with this happening with uh, Morgenstern that he uh, injured himself, then he gets a chance to jump in Engelberg, comes into the tournament and is just happy that he can be in the tournament. And then manage, manages to, to find a good rhythm in the first competition and has one, his for sure best jumps so far and is on the, close to the podium or he's actually on the podium and then yeah without much thinking goes to the next competition and wins the competition the question is what happens next Alexander Stokel, who coaches, of course, the Norwegians these days, but early on was Dietart's coach at the Ski Academy yeah, of Stans. Well, everybody was expecting Armand Stock or Schlierenzauer as the winner of the tournament. But as Thomas says, the Four Hills have always been my childhood dream. Like for every ski jumper, I guess. Uh, it has a really high significance because one has to be good at all four competitions, not one. And the fact that I'm the leader here is just a bit crazy. So inside four minutes to the start of the competition and have a look at that air temperature, almost plus 10 Celsius. And as a result of that, uh, we've had some drainage cuts uh, put in onto the in-run to drain away the water from the uh, in-run itself and to keep that safe and secure for the competition. So we're on the famous Bergiesel, of course, the new 
remodeled Bergiesel, but it's great to see almost a capacity crowd here at the heart of Innsbruck, the capital of the Austrian Tyrol. And there is the situation after the competition, of course, in Garmisch Partenkirchen. In terms of distance, Diethardt leads Morgenstern by six and a quarter meters, six and a quarter meters. Simon Oman seven and a quarter back. And then Kasai eight and a half back, so 18 and a half back, I should say, and 19 and a quarter back to Bardal. So the gap's really opening up, and to Schleri, who was hoping to make it three in a row, 26 and a half metres the deficit, and to Kamil Stock, then 31 and a quarter. So these are the matchups for today in tricky, windy conditions. Schlierenzauer should get the better of Hatzadinov and having a look at the next group here. That's a really interesting matchup between Korfler and Yanni Ahonen, of course, two former Four Hills winners. Ahonen on no less than five occasions. And then this next little group, uh, well, I think that uh, Kubatsky could get the better of Della Sega and Deschwanden. Uh, on yesterday's evidence, although he had wind advantage in his favor, should dispose of Schiffner. The all Polish uh, match there, Moranka is the man who's at the moment slightly better and slightly more consistent in terms of form. Severin Freund, that's a dream draw for him, although he's not in top shape at the moment. Jakobsen and Fetner, one would hope that Jakobsen's fortunes perhaps turn a little bit, uh, but that's no. Nothing to say against Fetner. This is a local hill for him. But have a look at the last couple of matchups there. Well, before that, Bardell and Takaushi, that's uh, tasty. Diethardt against Aman, because Aman didn't take his jump yesterday. And Morgenstern, who also declined to take his qualification effort, comes up against the man who won the qualification, Norway's Anders Fanamel. So there, some of the coaches and also uh, our international commentary boxes. Two, three layers of television and radio there. It's an excellent facility here up on the Bergiesel. And as I said, the wind is almost essentially going to play uh, a major part. At the moment, the wind is from the front in all sectors at around about one and a half to two and a half meters per second. It's stronger over the knoll than it is in the landing zone. And you can see the big net there on jumpers left to your right as you see it. And also some net protection on jumpers right, but not to the same extent. And friends and family of well, Dietart, Schlierenzauer, um, all here to uh, see their favorite sons. And Schlieri's uh, family, of course, hugely supportive. And he always makes a point of saying how wonderful they are. They keep him grounded. And he's going to start us off from gate number 13, front wind in all sectors at the moment. It's a big roar from the crowd here, gate 13, as he gets us underway. And what a good start in favourable conditions, and he'll be really happy with that. That's about 10 metres beyond the calculation line. 130 is the hill size, he's over that and only three meters short of the hill record set by Sven Hannewald of Germany back in 2002 when he achieved that unique Grand Slam of all four hills in a single season. Very quickly over his skis, the timing was good and much more like a free spirit and he's got to come from a long way back and I realistically, I don't think he can win the Four Hills, unless, of course, the favourites start falling over. But that's a big confidence boost. And look at that, minus 12.3, the deduction. That tells you how strong that front wind is. 12 points, that's like getting a almost six and a half metre boost. 
Hatsadino for Russia. And he's 115 metres, and the wind just dropped fantastically. The strength just subsided there. And unfortunately, he'll be the first man into the lucky loser pool. And just a reminder for those of you who may be joining us for the first time for the Four Hills, as a result of yesterday's qualification, we have 25 head-to-head -head duels. The winners go through automatically to the second round. And then there are five lucky loser places from the men who are defeated, those who get the best or the highest set of points. The top five join the 25. So Schleary is through, and now it's the Czech Republic versus Germany. Jan Matura, better in Garmisch. Andreas Bank, who will follow a stable for Germany. So still gate 13 and Miran Tepes. He knows that it was going to be a difficult call today, David Eurotech, and asking Yamatura to slide back. And I can tell you that's because the wind suddenly gusted up into the red zone. And we're just about uh, hitting three meters per second, as you can see there, in quite a lot of sectors. And also it's turning. So far from stable. But this was predicted for today. And you need uh, patience. And for Miran, absolutely the neutral. He will be trying his best to give everybody the best opportunity. So David Yuratek in the green there to the right. Werner Schuster, the men who respectively as head coaches look after Jan Matura and Andreas Vank. So out again. These guys are pretty experienced. Matura, who's never really produced a result in Innsbruck. Gets to just around the calculation line. The wind is strong as ever for me, but Matura just a little unsettled. And now it's really blowing up a Huli. Can't really tell too much from that angle. But it wasn't by any means uh, textbook perfect. And as a result of that, he slips uh, down and opens the door when it becomes the turn of Andreas Vank. You see, that says 2.7. I can tell you that there is violent red across all of my computer screen at the moment and Andreas Vank uh, no point in him sliding out at the moment it's up to six meters per second five meters per second the wind predominantly coming on his left hand side that's from your right as you look at the picture there you are you can see that uh, vicious and violent wind and look at the uh, wind net there on the right by the commentary boxes just by us and you can see how that's being blown into but still now it's coming down a little bit which may offer some possibility very good afternoon to frank in spain uh, couldn't agree with you more frank hope you're uh, having some better weather in your part of the world yeah i think this could be a little bit of a lottery because of the violent changes of strength and direction. But here comes Andreas Mark, three times in the top 15 since Engelberg. And that's about 115 uh, metres. And so consequently, that's uh, a situation which leaves, in fact, it's not as much as that. And Jan Matura now will be the benefactor of this. Although the compensation has been increased for backwind conditions, in these frontwind conditions, when you get these violent changes of strength, then uh, it does become, as Frank's just uh, emailed us, uh, a bit of a lottery. And uh, that goes into the 
lucky loser pool, but he'd be very lucky to stay there. So now we go on to Noriaki Kasai, one of our previous seven winners here. 1991. Kasai, good spread over the skis quickly. And that's lovely. That is over 125 meters. He's up against Finland's Koivan Anto, who's found a bit of form. 126. Star was lovely. And I think he should get good marks for the flight phase and the touchdown. And I just think it's uh, a wonderful thing to see this man recapture the form he's in at the moment. Look at that. I mean, that's worth a 19 or... One or two, are we going to get one and two? We've got uh, two of them. And that's the leading score. Surely, 120, well, actually, I'm looking at that and looking at the front wind deduction at the moment. Schlieren's out, of course, had 131 and a half, so I don't think Kasai can go into the lead, but he could go into second place easily. Now, Ansi Koivaranta. Koivaranta, 25 years of age. Tenth in Garmisch, his season's best. He showed up well. They set himself up with a good platform in the first round. He's never been on the podium, but he's proved himself to be a great Nordic combiner. Many of you will remember him as a former Nordic combined World Cup winner. And then... Uh, he contracted a, a blood disorder which really affected his endurance uh, capabilities in terms of the cross-country skiing phase of Nordic Combined. And it was that that really triggered the decision for him to become a special jumper. So Finland taking on Japan here. Oh, what a good effort by Koivaranta. Very strong front wind, but the timing was excellent. You don't get the distance even with the front wind unless you time it and the transition. And I should think Kasai is shot. But this is great news for Finnish ski jumping. Ahonen so far has not been all he or perhaps his fans would have hoped for in the tournée. But this is the bright light, the light maybe coming from the end of the tunnel in terms of an athlete who not only for the remainder of the World Cup season, there's a long way to go, but who might individually at Sochi be able to produce a medal challenge. 132 and a half meters, terrifically stable. Pekka Niemela, you never saw that last season or indeed the season before. And would you believe that uh, Kasai is going into the lucky loser pool? He's in there with a commanding 121.3 points. He's the top of the leaderboard, but it's going to be a long wait. Antonin Hajek for uh, the Czech Republic to go first against his German opponents. Six years more experience than Geiger to follow. And just about the calculation line, gate 13. And there will be little point in changing the gate in these varied conditions because you'd be changing it all day. 119 and a half, and that gives a chance to Carl Geiger. Ambitious uh, young man, Carl Geiger. As I said yesterday, I just have the sense with Carl that he might miss out on the selection for Sochi but he did that well there last year he got his personal best there but if Germany comes with all its strength then Karl Geiger might just miss out but there is Werner Schuster look at that uh, wind at the moment it was worth over five meters of boost for Hajek so not a great effort and Geiger Very similar, in fact, I would say a little short in distance compared. And these two men coming under pressure and not reacting well off the table.
afternoon, uh, Christoph in Poland. Uh, I think you're echoing what a few of you are thinking about that, you know, the wind is going to play more of a part than we would wish here. And uh, you can see that Geiger's the one who's gone into the lucky loser pool. And uh, next up, now this is a really good uh, matchup here. 23 year old Austrian Michael Habeck for the local fans. A big roar for him. But frustration there, a few groans coming in. And Habeck there, 116 metres, just looking at the wind there. It's still front wind, but it dropped decisively. At the moment, it's calming down to more like uh, one and a half to two metres per second. And Andy Bellinger, this may be a godsend. Uh, Habeck, who's done so well this season, he's done such a good job for the Austrians, particularly in Continental Cup, where he currently lies in second position. I have to say, though, that he's never had a particularly good result in World Cup in Innsbruck, but then Wellinger's not achieved one either. And Wellinger's done just enough. The win much stronger over the null at 120 metres. Kasai leads the lucky loser pool by some margin. And then you've got uh, Geiger and Vank and Hatsadinov. And there's the decision, and Wellinger goes through. Everybody getting excited now for the next duel because it brings together two former champions of this hill. Yanni Ahonen, who won in 2003 and then again in 2008, so originally on the old Bergiesel, Andy Kurfler on the new Bergiesel in 2012. He's had uh, actually uh, three top ten finishes here, but Ahonen has the stronger record, two victories, uh, three times third, once a runner-up here. This has been a happy hunting ground for him in terms of four hills, but he finds himself as the outsider, according to yesterday's qualification, when he was five metres short in distance over... or just, uh, yeah, five metres short in distance compared to uh, Kufla. So just a reminder, our email address, nordicskitv at gmail.com, and waiting his turn, Jan Jobro. Also, uh, Patient Ronan Lamy Chapuis, the only Frenchman in because once again Vincent de Comsevoir. And there's the sort of view you get from the warm up room. And just look at that massive crowd. They're praying that the Austrian success can really continue the majority of them. But this is actually a world class uh, amphitheatre. Lots and lots of international tourists here to support their teams. So, Anhahonen. And wherever he goes today, that probably settles finally once and for all that the Four Hills is not going to be his for a record sixth time. A lot of these men are having difficulty with the wind conditions, but not all of them are producing bad performances technically. Ahun and star marks will reflect a little of that, but now Andy Kofler, and there'll be a big roar for this man. I just remember him when he stood here at the out, top of the outrun in 2012, and he just looked at this, and it was like adoration. He is one of Austria's favourite sons. He's got a great personality, 
A lot of warmth between him and his fans. Not bad on the takeoff, but. Kofler suffering the turn of the wind. Backwind coming in at the moment of takeoff, and Ahonen will go through, and Kofler will go into the lucky loser pool, but with very little hope of survival. So that is a big disappointment, and this is where it is so difficult to control the situation. And it's now back to a front win. It just turned. Richard Freitag next to go, and the win now, all front win, two, two and a half metres per second. There's the difference, and Freitag, after Garmisch, where he finished ninth, just finding that confidence, that feeling again. And this is what Germany needs. He's essentially the number two to Severin Freund, who's had his own struggles in this season's Four Hills. But this is good news. And he has a real chance of bettering his best performance here, which is actually 30th. But that was all of, what, four years ago. And Richard Freitag, that's a good gauntlet uh, thrown down. Wind strengthening again for Rune Velta. Ski flying world silver medalist with a personal best of 243 metres. Will he be out the stadium if he did that here? Velta. And just over the calculation line. And a sort of uncertainty there about his work. And 120.5, and Freitag easily wins that head-to-head -head duel. But, of course, what everybody's concentrating on is getting the best number of points. It's Koivananta leading from Schlierensau at the moment with 127.5 points ahead of Schlieri's 125.4. Kasai in third place, but remember, he's in the lucky loser pool, so he has to uh, stay within that. Runevelt has gone into second place, but Kasai's well ahead of the other four in the lucky loser pool at the moment. That's Velter, Geiger, Vank, and Kebok. Now, Michael Neumar. In trouble. Up against Slovenia's uh, Rock Justine. 114 and a half, and even if he went into the lucky loser pool here, he'd uh, be in problems. So, Rock just in, chance here. Luki Neumar yet to find his very best in consistent form, and Justin skis quite tied up to his face there, and he's short of the calculation line again. I would say a little late off the table, and that's affected his performance. 117, and the star marks, I think, would be similar. But the wind deduction will be the difference here because there's about six points difference between the two men in terms of the stronger wind that the Slovenian got. It's worth about three metres. And remember that Neumar, 114 and a half, that differential in wind deduction is going to bring these two men closer. Neumar's won it. Oh! 
That's a little bit like Kamil Stock in Obersdorf. He's been so lucky to win that duel, and he's won it by 0.2 of a point. Yaka Murta. I wonder whether he's been inspired by Ansi Koivaranta. He's done pretty well in his own right, this rookie in his Four Hills first appearance here, and that's terrific. The wind strengthened, and he took advantage. But when you look at his performances, 23rd in Oberstdorf, OK, 36th in Garmisch, but only 19. And Pekka Niemela, they finished dinner table a lot happier these days. Everything has to be kept in perspective. They didn't bring him here to set the world alight, but I guess plenty of you at home never imagined that Thomas Diethardt would go from, what, virtually zero in most people's eyes to into the top ten in the space of four competitions. Now Watasi, his opponent, Pura Murta. Predominantly on a decline, and Murta's got his scalp. And he's got his scalp by best part of 10 meters. So Watasi will drop into the lucky loser pool, I would say. And either Heibok or Vank are going to drop out here. Latassi, who's not really shown anything at this year's Four Hills. He started off the uh, season in 17th place at Klingenthal, and he's now slumped to 44th in the World Cup rankings. But that must be uh, a nice feeling, a nice sense of inner walls, because he knows he's into the point scoring round for the third consecutive hill. Now, Matek Kot versus Ito. Too difficult to call on yesterday's form. And Cott, again, another athlete who's been slipping down the table from sixth early in the campaign to 17th now, 18th, in fact. And Daiki Ito, 16th and 18th in the two competitions so far. There's only one place between these two guys in the Four Hills rankings. So that's why this is so hard. And there you can see that green for the wind turning behind. Ito now to take his turn. And it's... It's turning all the time. It's, I would stay still, predominantly just backwind. And Ito subsides, and this is the problem about this competition in these conditions, because it's not about just beating your opponent, it's accumulating the points that you need to be competitive in the next round. And of course, that isn't going to happen really here for either man. And Ito suddenly having a dark period. So now on to two 23-year-olds, neither of whom have got any record at the Four Hills so far. The Italian, Della Sega, to go first. David Kubatsky for Poland to follow. <laughs> Ironically, they've both got personal best to uh, Engelberg. And Della Sega more like 115 metres. Front win returning now. Now, Kubatsky who characteristically often fades out to the right, has a real chance here.
So, Kubatsky. Far from clear as to who Lukas Krojcik would pick to go to Sochi. Won't decide till after the competitions in Wiesland Zakopane. But any time is a good time to show your colours. And again, there won't be too much between these two men in terms of distance. I think that's just short. Yes, it is just short by a couple of metres. There won't be much in terms of style differential. There'll be, I think, De La Sega is going to get the better of this because the wind had just strengthened a little bit more for Kubatsky, and therefore the deduction is going to be greater. And it's going to go to the Italian now. Uh, De La Sega, this is going to be a welcome, a welcome piece of fortune for the Italians who have really struggled. Davide Bressadola replaced by Sebastian Colorado, but so far the Italians this season have not had much success. Just to quickly uh, uh, tell you who didn't make it on uh, yesterday's qualification, Nicholas Ferrell, who won the US trials and a ticket to Sochi, he failed to qualify. Manuel Poppinger for Austria, who leads the Continental Cup rankings, he didn't make it. Poland's Christoph Biegen, uh, Slovenia's Yuri Tepes and uh, Jan uh, Damian, Jakob Jander for the Czech Republic, Hilda of Norway, who is uh, in a very dark place at the moment, and Ingvaldsen, his teammate, Okabe for uh, Japan, also uh, out of it. So, waiting their uh, turns patiently up there. This is the situation. Look at the differential between Kasai and the other four men in the continent in the lucky loser pool. Afternoon, Steve in Watford. Uh, I think it's a very different story, Steve. I mean, if uh, uh, we had a uh, talent scouting team to identify some athletes who were potentially uh, gifted or physically equipped to take on the sport of uh, ski jumping, but then we'd need to uh, get them at a young enough age to be able to fund them, maybe a scholarship or something like that to go to Stams or Lillehammer because that's the way and yeah, there's no quick fix unless you buy someone in uh, the journey would be a long one and even if you did it today you still wouldn't have anybody probably in uh, place for our here in 2018 maybe for the winter games of 2022 so now Marcus Schiffner member of the national team asked to uh, drop back there His home hill is actually uh, Hinsenbach, Upper Austria, and is not particularly to the fore in this season's Continental Cup rankings, and is a year younger than today's Swiss opponent. Afternoon, uh, Roger and Gillingham. Totally agree with you. You, have, uh, you do indeed have respect for these guys in all conditions, but on a day like this, Schiffner and he's at about 110 metres. To be honest, I didn't really expect him to set the world alight, and it's going to be fascinating now because he's given a great opportunity to Deschwanden, who started the season so well with promise in Klingenthal. Many of you will remember that 10th uh, place finish. And since then, of course, he's declined uh, down to 33rd place in the World Cup rankings. On his four hills side, the man who's going to take his turn in a moment. Well, he's qualified for both competitions, but never made the cut in Oberstdorf and never made the cut in Garmisch. 
for the decisive second round. But this is his moment. Just going to take another check on that wind. And the wind really strong, up to six metres per second. Four, five, six metres per second at the moment. That's why Desvanden is sitting on the sidelines there. And there you have it. Afternoon, uh, <laughs> sir. Uh, you think that uh, Andy Kufler may have upset the uh, gods up there. I'm sure he hasn't, but uh, he does have these moments of apparently really poor fortune. But I also know that he's a guy that can bounce back. And uh, although he's never really been at the races in the sense of this year's Four Hills, um, let's hope that the next phase after the Four Hills, building up to Sochi, will see him come back to really good form and command a selection for the Winter Olympics, because of course he missed out last year really in the World Championships in Val de Fiemme. Afternoon to uh, Steve in Bristol. Uh, well, it's uh, make or break day really for Simon Oman, uh, your favorite. And uh, I have to say that uh, it's gonna be uh, really interesting because He's got uh, some distance to make up, having led after Obersdorf. Simon Oman with seven and a quarter meters to five. But I would say here that the main thing, if you, could, if you can win, that would be great. But on the other hand, damage limitation. He mustn't fall any further behind. Seven meters in Bishop's Oven, you can turn around. So. Martin Krunzel, flag in the air, and the wind is still way too strong. And I think we're going to have a little bit of a mini break here. Uh, talking to Miran Tepes, he was quite confident uh, that his assessment of the weather would allow him to manage this competition. I have to say, that was just about, or he was just about the only one uh, with that progno uh, prognostication. Uh, all the others said, no way will we jump today. So uh, already, to a certain extent, he's been proven right. But there's no doubt that there is something of a lottery about today's competition. Looking uh, quite serious there. One or two of these uh, men. Interesting that Peter Frenet from the United States qualified, uh, as opposed to uh, Nicholas Farrell. And there you can see that uh, wind, and you can see a little indicator of the speed. I'm looking at my computer, and it's now uh, more like three and a half meters per second. Remember, the way this is worked out, the wind and gate compensation, uh, seven instruments on either side of the hill, feeding in their respective data. Then that all uh, mushes into an equation which is far too difficult for me to ever explain. And then predominantly it comes out with a decision saying whether it's either front or back wind. Um, but you always have the sense here that even that's not an exact uh, science. And so in these sort of conditions, um, even that mechanism can't really equalize the competition in the way one would wish. Afternoon to uh, Janusz in uh, Poland. Many thanks for your uh, help with some of these 
Polish pronunciations, always welcome. And uh, also uh, with the Czech ones. Paul up in Huddersfield, good to have you with us. I'll come back to your question in a moment. Despondent on his way, the wind about two metres per second. And he's done it. Switzerland have got one through to the second round, and it's Gregor Desvanden there. Through with 124 metres, so well worth the wait. And the 124 metres definitely going to put him, I would say, round about the top five, although there's a bit of a deduction, a little wobble there on the landing. And Deschwanden into, in fact, seventh place. That puts him 15, almost 16 points behind Koivaranta. And that's the important factor here. Koivaranta in a very good position to go for the podium at the moment, but some way to go. And now Ziobro versus Muranka, an all Polish affair. But it's going to take something over the calculation line by Moranka to win this one, I would say, but I would still edge <laughs> on the side of Moranka, given the fact that his two performances have been more consistent, 14th and 17th, than Ziobro, of course, who had that great Engelberg weekend. So who goes into the lucky loser pool for Poland? Who goes directly into the second round? One hundred and twenty two meters. Style and distance. And there it is. And Moranka. He is really enjoyable behind behind uh, stock in the World Cup points, but in every other way, the leading Polish youngster. Big win deduction, and that will play its part. Over eight metres coming off his score. Now, this will be interesting. Moranka. Moranka, better start. He's going to get there because that wind is going to uh, change things. And Moranka gets through in eighth place, very quickly on now by Milan Tepes. Kraft for Austria against Laglitz for Slovenia. Stefan Kraft into bonus points. There is an urgency about this first round now. The turbulence around the hill is very tricky indeed. Koivaranta still leads, clearance our second. Kasai from the lucky loser pool in third place overall at the moment. Yoko uh, uh, Murta for Finland in fourth overall. Two Finns in the top five in the points rankings at the moment. Now, Stefan Kraft, three times in the, the top 15 this season against a man who's been twice in the top 30, Thomas Naglic, but just a a sense from my side that Naglic might just be beginning to get a little confidence here. Remember, these men, they react to the traffic light and the confirmation of the flag waved by their coach. They don't see any of these uh, wind monitors. Uh, they can feel, but they don't worry about it. They just get on with it. And comes back if it's a long delay might just unclip his bindings and then you build up the position again and still after this 11 jewels to come and as Bardell having a little wander around there's Milan Tepes bobble on hat and it stays like this where he really earns his corn So out again, 
Stefan Kraft. Backwind, or sorry, front wind, just a little bit stronger for him at the moment than it was for Kraft. Now, Kraft got 123 and a half, and this is virtually the same. A 121, and star marks. Are I think this is going to go to Stefan Kraft, and that'll be. A welcome change of fortune for Stefan, who achieved his personal best last season in the Four Hills when he was on the podium in third place in Bishopshoven. And Kraft gets through. Straight on now to Peter Frenette for the United States. No record whatsoever in this season's competition. know that all the real attention in terms of ski jumping is going to be about the American women when it comes to uh, Sochi. Will Sarah Hendrickson get back in time? Will Jessica Jerome, who already won the US trials and booked her place for Sochi? Now, Severin Freund uncharacteristically did not qualify for the Final round in Garmisch. And easily, in terms of distance, defeats the American. But of course, it's the number of points that he accumulates. There's not a huge amount of emotion coming out of Severin at the moment there. Are things going on his head, which he's trying to work out, but it's, he hasn't solved the problem yet. So if you're in the top 20 now, you're sitting in a pretty strong position with uh, Koivaranta, Schlierenzauer, Kasai, here you go, 10 jewels to come. Now, those in orange, of course, are your lucky losers at the moment. Nuglic into second place there, so has a chance, probably a pretty good one as it stands. Giobro, Runvelta, similar territory. Karl Geiger, the man who's on the verge of elimination, so just make a note of that, 118 meters 103 points and outside there you can see Andreas Vank and Heiduk uh, for Austria Hatsadinov and all of those now I'm afraid their Bogiesel experience is over so here we go Ronan Lamy Chapuis the lone Frenchman flying the flag against Slovenia's uh, Peda Preuc everything loaded in the favor of the Slovenian and I have to say that Ronan Lamy Chapuis has stuck to his task pretty well, particularly because this is the third out of the three hills which he's actually qualified for, and I think that's uh, worth a pat on the back given his relative inexperience. No uh, Vincent Descombe Savoie, who's really uh, in an outside place at the moment. Now, Preuch. Third equal with Thomas Dietart in Oberstdorf. Not quite so good in uh, Garmisch, down to 18th place. Overall sixth in the tournée. And that's a welcome reward there. Just looking at the wind strength was strong for both of them in their favor. 128. And... The execution here, really lovely. Look at the way that he actually shows that little bit of aggression, indicating his confidence, and goes into third place overall. That's very good, and that puts him only five points behind Koivaranta. Colorado for Italy. They've already got Della Sega through. 
And this man who came in to replace Bressadola, the Italians with only two slots. That's their quota. And Kornilov, who got a massive front win boost yesterday in qualifi qualification. Up to 128 and a half meters, Colorado's opponent. But everything else that he's done this season, that's Kornilov I'm talking about. Here he is, as uh, suggested otherwise. He's lost 20 places since the beginning of the World Cup season. And he's got good fortune again. But actually, to his credit, also executed that really quite well. And suddenly, the Russians... Arefiev, Alexander Arefiev has got something to smile about. He was pretty stable. A nod of approval. There's the smile. And that's pretty good. It's put Kornilov into overall sixth place. 10.3 points, a little more than five metres, five and a half metres off the lead. Slava, Czech Republic versus Hvala, Slovenia. And the wind, well, it became violent and turbulent. And he's done the only thing he can do, which is survive. But I'm afraid at the cost of going out of the competition. So, uh, Lava, Czech Republic, lying in 31st place in the tournée. And here's the man who's lying in... 32nd place in the tournée, Slovenia's Jaka Chvala. Well, two really forgettable efforts, really, in a sense, but Chvala getting the victory, but he's going to start very early in the first round, sorry, in the final round, I should say. Wind changing now. Wind changing could be going towards backwind again. As the crescendo rises for Manu Fetner from the Tyrol. Here he is. Lying fourth in the Continental Cup. His personal best four years ago in Oberstdorf when he was on the podium. Just looking at the wind, it's really... Uh, now it's backwind and it's strong backwind at the moment. And I wouldn't, oh, it's, he's going, he's going. And this may be difficult for Fetner. Dropped a little bit at the moment of takeoff. And he's got the best out of it. It really changed. When he came down the in run, it was almost like a five, a five meter deduction. It's ended up turning around a front wind and half a metre in his favour. Just short of the calculation line. Up against the 2007 Four Hills winner, Anders Jakobsen, who deserves a change of fortune. Four times he's finished in the top ten here. Wind at the moment pretty quiet as he takes off. Front wind building. Oof. Well, he's there in terms of the distance required, but only, as you can see there, by a metre. Now, the star is better. He was much better in the flight phase. Also, the touchdown, the stability of the landing, and I would say he's at least a point better than Fetner, and he needs to be because the front wind was stronger, and Alexander Sturkel there, he knows that Jakobsen's had a bit of fortune. He's through, but he's 14, almost 15 points off Koivaranta, who still leads. Canada versus Poland coming up. Mackenzie boyd Klaus versus the world champion. Kamil Stock, who has 
a mountain to climb to get back into this competition. First, the Canadian. Now, Camille, this is where he needs the gods on his side in a very big way to bite into the distance. He started the day 56 and a half points, which equates to 31 and a quarter meters behind the Fierschansen leader, Thomas Dietard of Austria. And you could say that he really needs the Polish number one. He needs a big boost of front wind to break the hill record if he can. The wind is building, stocks timing, and that's not bad at all. This time, the first effort is OK. The wind deduction is actually only about a metre and a half in terms of distance. The style is very good. Look at this. Very quickly over the skis, good telemark landing, held very well, and he's gone second. Stock has gone second, and he's only 1.3 points behind Koivaranta, ahead of Schlierenzauer. Next man here, Taku, uh, Takuchi for Japan. Oh, it's just Ito and Takauchi, they just at the moment are in a moment of decline. He's in a duel here where both of these men, Takauchi and Bardal, his opponents, both of them have achieved third place on the podium here on the Bergisel. In Takauchi's case, it was two years ago. In Bardal's, it was last season. Back wins for Takauchi. Now, Bardal. Same situation, Bardal 19 and a quarter meters off the leader, Dietart. He cannot afford any mistakes. He can't be left behind. He's got to be up there with the leaders. So, backwind really strong now for him. Growing all the time as he comes down the in-run, drops a little bit. And Bardal is in trouble. Not in terms of uh, Takauchi, but in terms of his overall challenge for the Fierschansen. 115 meters, and the backwind compensation that he's going to get is 10.7, so that's going to help him with an extra six meters. But as you can see, it only puts him into 10th place, and that leaves him 14 points behind the current leader, and that's worth close on eight meters. Difficult to make that up in the second round. Kosicek, Czech Republic, Kraus Germany to follow. Still back wins. And, well, nothing to say there, just really disappointing. And the Czechs not having a, a really difficult time today. So once again, uh, a pause. So Marinus Kraus, the runner-up in last season's Continental Cup, who so far good in Oberstdorf, eighth there, but not so good in uh, Garmisch, 35th, and holds overall 22nd position. He's one of those young German talents. Werner Schuster has seen him run it up as runner-up in Kusamo at the beginning of the season, but now down to 11th place, just out of the pre-qualified group, uh, Marinus Kraus. I have to say, this is one of the most open seasons we've had in terms of World Cup. 
and also uh, four hills. The bookmakers, by the way, they uh, couldn't do anything else other than making Thomas Diethardt uh, favorite, but they've made him virtually joint favorite with Tommy Morgenstern for this particular competition, but they still make him odds on for the overall title, which would be outstanding. It would be quite remarkable if Thomas Diethardt can continue this uh, purple patch, this gold run, which he's really got into now with the victory in Garmisch. So, Marinus Kraus. Only 22 years of age, and Schuster looking up there with uh, just a little bit of concern. The front wins in his favor. And big difference there. Back win for Kozicek, front wind. A difference of about 13 points in terms of compensation. So Marinus Kraus happily through from his regard. And 125 and a half. Uh, I wonder where that's going to put him, actually, when you balance it up. Should be in the top 10, I would think. Just looking at this, and in fact, he is exactly in 10th place. So uh, three head-to-head -head duels to come, but three big ones. Kranitz, who's never done much here against Lorzel, who's won here. And uh, Kranitz, backwind. And it really is fickle at the moment, the uh, wind here. Leutzel, Innsbruck 2009. Remember, he won the four hills title. He won three out of the four hills so far this season in the four hills. 17th ranked as a result of finishing 22nd and 25th. Now, biting his lip here. If Leutzel gets this right, he was excellent yesterday. 126 and a half meters. Timing was good, technically he was good. The landing was something uh, that took us back to the goal. Oh, and Leutzel, huge blast of backwind right on the takeoff. It was in the red zone right on the takeoff. And I just, he just walked down. There was nothing he could do about that. A massive turnaround there. I'm talking four to five meters of backwind as he came off the table. It just whipped. And Kofler, Leutzel out of the competition. And well, you can only say good fortune for Kranitz. And now to the two duels featuring the two men who didn't take their qualifying round. That is why Simon Armand, who denied the chance, saving energy, now he comes up against uh, Dietart. And this is where the men in the lucky losing pool, they start to shake. Martin Kunzel gives the office to Simon Armand. Wind at the moment, front wind, two, three meters per second. Timing looked good, and that's excellent. That is absolutely excellent, and that's exactly what Simi needed. Third place in the tournée, seven and a quarter meters behind Thomas Dietart, 133 and a half meters, just a meter short of Sven Hannevald's hill record dating back to him 12 years. And as that happens, I can tell you the winds again strengthened here. But the execution was pretty good, as you can see there. 18, 16 and a half from the Japanese judge, Ryushi Inke. Don't understand that. There was a definite telemark there. And <laughs> there's that magic pig there. That's uh, the good luck charm. And Dietart's going to need this now. This is a very tough call. Innsbruck, the crucial step, I think, for Dietart here against Simon Oman. If he doesn't beat the Swiss, he could go into the lucky loser pool, but look at this from Dietart. That is fantastic. 
the connectivity, the fluency, the style impeccable, the distance not enough to depose Simon Oman. I'm just looking at the relative wind differentials. Four meters, no, Simon Oman is going to win the duel, but Thomas Diethardt goes ahead of Kasai in the lucky loser pool. There's only one duel to come, so Diethardt is into overall fifth place, 4.8 points behind Koi Valanta. And now, Morgenstern, something of a mentor to Thomas Diethardt, up against the man who won qualification yesterday. Morgie, the Innsbruck winner of 2011. And that's a problem for Morgie. Morgan Stern in second place, six and a quarter meters off backwind of 5.7 points of compensation. And Fanamel, his opponent. Now, the key thing here is the number of points for Morgan Stern. Morgan Stern's got to get more than 107 points here to stay in the lucky loser pool and the folks from Canton there well you can see what they feel about it rotten conditions 118 points he's, he's just got to hope that Fanamel fails because Morgie is out of the competition otherwise and oh how tight is this Morgie may be lucky he is very lucky two men who've had Really mixed fortunes here, both of them, I think, in a different way. Fanamel only 115 and a half. Front wind deduction, Morgan Stern compensation. Morgie makes it, but only by the skin of his teeth. Look at that in 30th, 30, 30th place. Oh, sorry, eighth place. I beg your pardon, but that's almost five meters down on the lead. Well, it was always going to be a gripping first effort here. And it's Koi Anta who takes the honours. Dietart and Kasai in yellow there. The top two in the lucky loser pool. I can tell you that Naglic and Fetna and Ziobro have also made it. But have a look at the uh, differentials here. 127 points. Just going down the order to the top 30, the last man to make it, De La Sega. And there you can see it, 127 points versus less than 100. And that means the differential between first and 30th is more than 15 meters. But it's those top 30 who go through to the second round in reverse order to determine who wins the Bergiesel and who's still in with a shout of the 2014 Fjörschansen title as they move after this to Salzburger land and the Bishopshoven Big Hill. None of these men any more involved in the competition and uh, just about 15 minutes now to the start of the final and decisive round. Koivaranta, Finland in pole position. Welcome back to the Tyrol and Innsbruck and a fascinating situation at the moment. Koivaranta, 1.2 points ahead of Aman, who lies in a very, very promising second place. And Stoch up to third place, just 0.1 of a point behind Aman Schlierenzau in fourth. Well. Yesterday, our colleagues uh, caught up with uh, Simon Aman during the qualification. Anders Fanamel did the best competition. Simon Aman, though, he chose not to start 
But already we've seen that he's come through. Well, the atmosphere in the stadium here will be surely breathtaking, he says, talking about uh, the Bergis, or the result in Garmisch was great for this event here. There will be sure many people coming to the Bergis, for this remains a really difficult hill. I've never won here, but I'm really eager for this to maybe change. It's going to be difficult, and I have to make sure that things come together. For me, the tension before, the jump, the in-run, the takeoff, and then the flight, that's what I'll concentrate on, and then hopefully I'll be able to enjoy the stadium down in the finish. So, one month before Sochi, Aman wants to reach his best shape. For me, it's extremely important that here, where there are no excuses, things go well. The fact that the stakes are high, uh, that it's about uh, maintaining the lead in the four hills helps me to sharpen my focus even more, and I really love it. I fought for a long time to reach this level again, to be back in shape, enjoying what I do, and to be in the flow. The level of difficulty is extremely high. There are no guarantees for victory. To experience this and be able to improve even more is very important with me, or for me, I should say, with the Olympics just around the corner. I really enjoy making this progress. He is indeed the great improver, Simon Oman. And he's planning for this. Fia Shansen started back in 2011. Well, Simon Amman seeking to take the lead back from uh, Thomas Dietard. Well, not only Thomas Dietard is ahead of me, also Thomas Morgenstern, and he's very experienced. That's why it's going to be tough and exciting. I've uh, had quite a few situations like this, but at the moment I'm in really good shape. I've done many good jumps in the last competition, and that's something which is... I think going to carry me through the next competitions. I'm willing to evolve and get even better. It's a great situation and at the moment I'm managing it really well. And it's worth just uh, taking a look at that because uh, Morgenstern and Aman. Uh, Aman's uh, taken seven points out of him as a result of uh, today's competition, and he was only one and a half behind him at the start of the day. So technically, Aman now very much into uh, second place uh, behind uh, Dieter. But of course, he's also gained on Dieter, but he's Dieter's mathematically still ahead of the Swiss number one. So still about eight minutes to go before we start the second round. Just a chance to reflect on the top three performances. Stoch, uh, really good to see him putting a good one in here, but he needs that and he needs even more in the next round. Remember, for him to have the faintest chance of getting back into perhaps going for the podium of the Fierschansen, he needs to really perform to the max. He needs to win the second round and also hope that one or two of the leaders fall by the wayside. The likes of Dietard and Aman. Aman, though, just looks so solid. The great thing about this man, who is a qualified engineer, is he works things out so meticulously. He's never, to my mind, been an innovator, but an improver, absolutely. And he takes these little details. And just look at this. Couldn't understand why the Japanese judge didn't give him a telemark uh, judgment there, but that didn't happen. But nonetheless, 133 and a half, just shy of the hill record. But overall, you can just see why he feels so good. All the other judges, 18s, 18 and a half, and I think those were very fair marks. 
not his best telemark, and I think that's reflected in the judges who saw it as 18s. That's uh, Bachmeier of Austria, wouldn't argue with that, or indeed Angelica Goebel from Germany. But what about this? Ansi Koivaranta. Finland's a dark old place during the winter, but here's a ray of sunshine, and we came to see him as a Nordic combiner in Kusamo a decade ago, but now this is superb. He lives in Rovaniemi these days, yeah, just north of the Arctic Circle, but Ansi Koivaranta, a knee surgery ACL in the spring of last year, and then had to work his way back. And then after Kusamo this season got a bacterial infection which really laid him low and couldn't get involved in the sport until Obersdorf. And so in his own little way, Koivaranta having a mini Diethardt, Thomas Diethardt uh, four hills, not obviously to the same extent, but nonetheless, this is such good form to see from him and such a boost not only for that man who's come under a, a heck of a lot of fire and criticism but with Ahonen not the Ahonen of old Koivaranta the number one fin so we're going to take uh, one more uh, little break here and then get ready for the second round so please don't go anywhere just a reminder, NordicSkiTV at Gmail, our uh, email address, and we'll be back for the decisive part of this drama after this. Noon to you, 20 past three in the afternoon, the Bergiesel, as you can see, almost full to capacity on what is a very warm afternoon, plus 10 when we started the competition and now we're down to this final and decisive round in these fickle and all time changing weather conditions here. I'm David Goldstrom and along with Eurosports Nordic team, thank you for watching, thank you for being with us and now we look forward in about three minutes time to the round that will decide who will win the Bergiesel. This particular hill, even in its new model form, still regarded as probably the most difficult of the foursome. And there is the Austrian Tyrol, as you can see there, not too much snow around at the moment. The fern wind that was around here earlier in the week caused the complete destruction of the preparations of the hill. They had to go and make it all again. And there you can see this unique bowl housing just about up to 25,000 spectators here. And like Oslo with an upturned outrun like Wiesler in Poland, similar to that. But here, the atmosphere, absolutely terrific. And this is certainly one of my favorite hills. And this is the order they're going to go in. The top 30 separated top to bottom by 17 and a quarter meters. De La Sega, 30th at the halfway stage to go. The men in yellow getting into this by virtue of the lucky loser pool. But now this is regular round two, regular final round. And who is going to gain who is going to wane i can tell you that as a result of the first round Simon oman gained two meters on thomas diethardt whereas thomas morgenstern lost two meters to his austrian colleague uh, is that significant well we won't know at the moment and that's uh, <laughs> the sort of atmosphere we have on the bergiesel today morgenstern was six and a quarter behind diethardt at the beginning of the day, that makes him eight and a half behind. Simi was seven and a quarter behind. He's now five and a quarter behind. And that's the sort of distance that you can make up at uh, Bishopshoven on the biggest of the four hills. Well, just take that all in. It is an amazing sound. You get this sort of noise, but this amphitheater, this bowl here, that's what makes it so special. It just rotates the roar around here. So here we go. Sit back and enjoy the action. The round that will decide possibly the destiny of the 2014 
Pierre Sanson, Italy, Roberto della Sega, first time into the final round in the Pierre Sanson of 2014. 17 and a quarter meters behind Koivaranta of Finland. Gate 13 again, short of the calculation line. And uh, Roberto della Sega, well, if nothing else, he's going to get a World Cup point. The wind at the moment, front wind. Della Sega, not the most confident of athletes. Indifference in the skis there. The landing was sort of okay. And Della Sega there with 17s, even an 18 in there, but short of 200 points, which is our threshold of respectability in any ski jumping competition. Now, Mickey Neumar. Fortunate to make it through to this second round. Unusual to see him coming from so early in the final round. And the wind there just changing. It's actually a bit of a crosswind at the moment. From the right of your screen to the left, from Jumpers League left, and it's turned again. And Neumar having... I have to say, a day to uh, forget here. Mickey Neumar. And doesn't really uh, want to know much more about this, and I can actually understand that. Neumar, who... Just got the better of uh, Rock Justin, and now the wind very, very strong, up to four, five meters per second. It's just a question of whether this can be managed by that man on the right, who, when he's not uh, looking after the World Cup in the winter or the Summer Grand Prix in the summer, is out around the world on his sailing boat. He's done the circumnavigation Miran Tepes that's his other great passion but if there's anybody who understands the wind and its ways it's Miran Tepes Olympic medalist in his time of course for the former Yugoslavia with the team and Walter I think uh, just happy that we've got as far as we have because he's not had to make any reorganization no plans which I'm sure that were on his mind yesterday so uh, next man to go now Hvala Slovenia another fortunate qualifier And it is, I would say, just about a cross tailwind at the moment. But the wind is consistently much stronger at the moment. More than five points going on, six points advantage over Della Sega from the first round. So he is going to go into the lead, even with the deductions. But no big impact at the moment. This will just build up as we go along. And Walter there with a, is that one, two, three, four, a forest of radios. Now, Maciek Kot next to go. Maciek Kot only 0.4 of a point ahead of Kuala. And at the moment looking for some confidence, the Polish athlete. They've really got hit hard here in the Fierschansen. I think everybody was thinking after the first phase of this season's Beastman World Cup that when we came to the Four Hills that we see the likes of Zewa and Kot and Ziobro and, well, pretty well all of the young Polish boys really up there and at the rest of them. But in truth, only Stock and Moranka have been there or thereabouts. Afternoon, George, in uh, Newport. Uh, uh, 
Do I think uh, Thomas Dienhardt can make up the difference today? Um, yeah, I do, actually. I mean, he's the main thing for him is to just get a really good result and retain that advantage going into Bishopshoven, as big a cushion as he can. But at the moment, he looks like a really cool customer. He just doesn't get flustered about anything. He does what he has to do. And that's all he can do, really. And he's in one of those wonderful purple patches that he knows he just hopes that it'll go on forever and a day. And you can see what the problem is here now, this switch to backwind, very, very strong. And I really don't want this to turn into a run-round competition, but you never know, it might. And that would really highlight one or two fortunes. At the front end of the competition, of course, Koivaranta to go last, Aman, Stock Schleer and Zau, better performance from him. And remember, Schleery, there's a multi-winner here on the Bergiesel. The Austrians who are looking for one of their men to make it six in a row in the last six editions of this competition. But remember, through poor fortune, Kofler and also uh, Leutzel have gone out and Walter, who uh, had those side cuts put into the in run to drain the water out in these very warm conditions right before the competition started, perhaps a little concerned. So, Cot now, 0.4, 25 centimeters in hand over Yaka Kavala, but way behind the leaders after the first round. And getting close to 120 metres. I don't think he's quite there. Well, he is actually, 122, so he does go into the leaders and he stretches away from Kavala. There is a turnaround of about 11 points between the back wind that Kavala got and the front wind that Cott enjoyed. That's uh, worth about six meters, which puts them, in fact, a lot closer than you might imagine. Kvala on 212.1 points, and Cott on 212.3, and there it is. Cott gets there by just 0.2 of a point. Great illustration of the difference between how front wind and back wind. Hayek now for the Czech Republic. And his advantage over, got, well, call it half a metre. Couldn't call it more than that, really. Antonin. So, again, all eyes on the windscreen here and the computers. Again, you can see, here it goes. Playing up again. And that's the wise decision because it's gone a bit manic in most sectors for a moment. And you can just see the differential in the sky over the Tyrolean mountains. The Pachakofel at 2,246 metres. Or the series at uh, 2,718 in the South Innsbruck, of course, the host of not one but two Winter Olympics and also hosted the first uh, Youth Olympics, Winter Youth Olympics here in 2012. The extraordinary thing about the... They spent about 50 million euros rebuilding this hill. Why on earth didn't they uh, put the floodlights in? It's a complete mystery when you're spending that much money. There, it was quite controversial because they cut down a lot of trees, which uh, to a certain extent have diminished the amount of natural protection. But you would have thought with such a great arena that floodlights would have been the order of the day because they'd be much more expensive to introduce now. So 
So we now know that uh, this man has got to get right up over the calculation line. There you can see it, 120 and a half, probably a little bit more. And it hasn't happened, so Maciek Kot gains a place there. One thirteen and a half. He's way below what was required, and I would say there just got the legs straight, and I would say that was a little bit early there. The timing was off. Robert Kranitz uh, next to go. Also very fortunate in the first round to qualify to this stage of the competition. Kranitz, who's up against uh, Leutzel, and remember Leutzel had that awful blast of backwind. Less than 90 kilometers from gate number 13. I don't think that's really generating sufficient speed. And 116 meters makes him another victim for Matek Kot, who climbs from what was 27th place where he started to uh, 25th. And next up, it's Poland versus Poland because it's Jan Ziobro. And there's five points separating the two poles in Giobro's favor and that gives him an advantage of well let's be conservative and say two and a half meters so looking at I'd say that calculation line is a guide Lucas Kroshek on the left there the head coach now remember Cot had front wind and at the moment it's all over the place It's the turbulence which is the problem. Not so super for Superman today, Anders Bardell, a worried brow as Yobro sets down, feels the table. No, and it's not enough. He had the conditions to be able to, to do that, Giobro, but now the frustrations are setting in. And it's a competition like this which can really mess your head up. So good in Engelberg, everything going well for Giobro, not too bad in Oberstdorf, 17th, but then out of the second round in Garmisch, and here, Way, way back. Maciek Kot on the march. And now the two times Innsbruck winner, Jani Ahonen, who remembers how this hill was before and how it is now. Ahonen. No chance to get a sixth for Hills title. And, well, that seals it, I'm afraid. Back wins, and it changed. And to be honest, now it's all got to be about his other target and the reason for coming back. Well, he had a couple. One, he was really unhappy about finished fortunes. He wanted to come back. He believed that there was something he could offer, but he also wanted to give this a go to see whether he could win a sixth title. But his other big goal a gold medal, an individual gold medal at the Olympics. The Finns have got precious little chance of getting a team gold or team silver. They were, once upon a time, nailed on to get a team medal at the Olympic Games. Not so this season, so it's going to be all about individual effort for Yane. 
but disappointing to see such a great athlete subside in this way but don't write him off totally Jan Matura chasing Cot and the advantage becoming bigger all the time and Matura stops the uh, mini march of Maciek Kot. He got something out of Garmisch when he was 11th. And one of the more mature athletes. Have a look at this, comes to the edge, and then within a meter and a half, those legs are straight. He's quickly over his skis. And Matura could be in for a good little patch here in the days and weeks to come. David Eurotech satisfied with that and definitely the new leader. You can see just a, a whisker of front wind deduction. And he's taken an eight point advantage over Cot. And remember that Matura, when he started, had a six point advantage. So he really improved in every sense of the competition. Another of the lucky losers. And look at the strength of the win here for uh, Manu Fetner. Getting a lot of support from the Tyrolean fans. His dad, one of his great enthusiastic, uh, or one of the most enthusiastic I've ever met. But not in a pushy, nasty sense, but wanting Manu to do where he... I can remember when he did get that podium in Oberstdorf four years ago. That was the high point, and... Manu continues to work to try and achieve that again. And Matura wins that day. There are 20 to come. But at the uh, end of the first third of this second round, it's Matura from Machekot, from uh, Yakafala, the one, two, three. But remember, Matura. He started 19.5 uh, points down on Koivaranta, the halfway leader, and that was all of 10 going on 11 meters. So the next 10 may shake things up a little bit here. One or two big hitters on their day in the lineup. Next up, it's going to be Clemens Muranka for Poland. But this is the state of play. So Clemens Muranka next to go. He's got a one meter plus advantage over Jan Matura. Matura with 120 and a half and a little bit of front wind uh, deduction there in this group. Uh, Switzerland's Gregor Deschwanden and Germany's Annie Wenninger. Jakobsen, a former Four Hills winner again. Uh, Germany's uh, Severin Freund. Anders Bardal, perhaps the biggest of the names. 13 point, there he is, 13.8 points behind the leader at the halfway stage. He needs something humongous to get back and keep his chance alive for Bishopshoven come Sunday, come Monday, when this annual of most prestigious competitions comes to an end. Moranka. Well, even with a metre advantage, that doesn't deny Matura. It's 118. So it's... Two and a half meters short, call it one and a half. Star marks are okay. There's a little bit more wind deduction. There was a slightly stronger front wind there for Muranka, and that means that Matura is going to stay there. But I still think a pat on the back for Muranka. Remember, this is his first time into the Fier Shansen, and he's doing a really great job. He goes into second place, some six points behind Matura. Now, Deschwanden. 
one of the uh, big factors with this man, like so many. Can he possibly put two good efforts together? The Schlandern on his way. Wind a little bit all over the place. And the answer is yes. It was predominantly front wind and very strong in that landing zone. So he got some extension on the flight phase. And this is a real gauntlet thrown down. It's going to be, I tell you what, the deduction's going to be up there. 12 points will be the deduction. So that is like losing six, let's call it seven meters, just for ease of mathematics. It sort of takes him down to 122 and a half meters because of the strength. So, of course, he threatens Matura, but remember, style marks will help him big time. And Deschwanden takes an 11. Point, eight point lead. So Desfunden, how many scalps will he take? <laughs> so Walter uh, Walter Hofer from being on the coaches stand to the edge of the table, now up in the warm-up room, having a general prowl around. And Deschwanden to be taken on next by Andy Wellinger, just point one of a point ahead. And Werner Schuster wouldn't read much from his face, other than the fact that, uh, like a lot of the coaches, uh, you can see the tiredness beginning to creep in. This is a very intense competition not just for the athletes, but for the management of all the teams here. There's a lot to get organized. Skis, service, transport, hotels, food, timing, meetings here, meetings there. I know they're used to it, but you don't get much time to yourself during the Fierschansen. But they wouldn't swap it for anything. Now, 18-year-old Andy Bellinger. This is a big call for him against uh, Deschwanden. Win still mischievous at the moment. Bellinger from Rupolding, which is, of course, better known for Biathlon 29th and an unhappy competition in Oberstdorf where he felt he got bad fortune with the conditions as well. But fifth in Garmisch, much more like the sort of work that we've seen. And remember, he is number six in the overall Wiesman World Cup points for the season. Kasai, who was matched up against Koivaranta. Really competitive duel, Kasai into the lucky loser pool, but deservedly into this competition. And remember, Kasai also with a chance of the Pierschansen podium, and that would be something special. Wellinger. And just looking at that, there's no way that he can overtake uh, Deschwanden. Deschwanden's had one of those days. 10th in Klingenthal, slipping down the order, but this will be a big confidence for the Swiss number two. Bellinger, who started the day in 16th place in the Fierschansen ranking, and you sense the disappointment. He's hungry for success. And he definitely wants to go to Sochi. Nuglets. Now, I thought that Nuglets would actually qualify by his own right, but it was through the lucky loser pool. Now, this is his opportunity to try and put things right, but he was only 0.6 of a point ahead of Deschwanden. So it's 0.9 equals half a meter, 1.8 per meter, etc. And so that tells you how uh, close it is.
Afternoon, uh, Fiona in Hexham. Interesting question. Didn't know you were a Swedish fan. Where are all the Swedish ski jumpers? Um, very good question. Of course, they were coached by Wolfgang Hartmann, who's now gone to look after the Koreans with the Nordic Ski World Championships uh, not so far away around the corner in Falun. Uh, that's a, a big and pertinent question. No, uh, and Naglitz, that's, you know, he got released in backwind conditions and you can see how soft it is on that slope. And he's uh, missed the outrun gate there. He's going to have to slide down those little terraces. Yeah, that's probably the sensible thing. Take him off and walk up. Now, end of the table. So Deschwanden, another scalp, and now it's Jakobsen. Switzerland facing Norway. Uh, Philip in Penzance, uh, well, good to hear that you're OK down there and you haven't got drowned out. Well, hopefully not. Um, yeah, it's always been measured to half a metre. You're right, it could be to centimetres and millimetres. More of that in a moment. Jakobsen, good height, good flight, and lovely! Gets a telemark, and at, at Jakobsen at last. Front wins, and he took every advantage he could out of that. Now, Desfandon got very high style marks here. You've got to take into account that he had about half a metre in hand, but Deschwanden, remember, 129 and a half metres. The deduction for Jakobsen is going to be stronger, so he can't, even with his mini advantage, he can't quite get into first place, not by my calculations. And second, yep, second, and he misses out by four and a half points, but at least it's more respectable. Severin Freund, Germany. Similar sort of chance for him as it was for Jakobsen, and this time in run speed 91.5, much better than in the first round. And similar fortune really for Freund, he can't depose Deschwanden. Deschwanden will be hoping that this might be a day for his personal best, which, remember, was 10th in the very first competition of this season in Klingenthal. Oh, he can get there. How does he get there? Let me re-examine that point's advantage over Deschwanden. There's 1.4 points. So that's three quarters of a metre, but he was two metres behind. And it's the difference in the win deduction of three points. And he gets there by just point one of a point. So that's how deceptive it was. The three point differential in terms of the front wind deduction, which is worth one and a half meters, that has made all the difference to Severin Freund, who leads by point one of a point over Deschwanden, Jakobsen to third and Matura off the podium. Now, a big moment in this season's career for Anders Bardal, who hasn't been quite as consistent in the Fierschansen than he was in the first phase of the World Cup season. Well, the telemark is good. Again, he's down on distance. He's got about the same wind conditions as Severin Freund. Now, the style would be better for me, but the distance is less. It's three metres less than Severin Freund and some five metres short of Deschwanden, which to me suggests that he probably is going to go into third place. And indeed, 230. 
So he pushes his teammate Anders Jakobsen off the podium. But it's worth remembering that there are still 13 to come. So that is not good news in Bardal's quest for the Fischansen. Or indeed Norway's, because there is no Norwegian in the top 10. Wearing a bib number four, Germany, Marinus Kraus. Plenty of spectators have come across from Bavaria. There's a few of his home fans. Kraus, who so far has kept defying the odds, and he's done it again. <laughs> and he does get the Telemark touchdown so well. Now, looking at Marinus Kraus, he did have an advantage over his teammate Severin Freund. Just a little bit more than half a metre. Freund, 127 and a half. The style marks here are considerably better than Freund by about a point. So that's a three point advantage. However, the wind deduction is similar. He might just do this, you know. On style and first round advantage, Kraus to take over from Freund. Wait for it, he's there. He's done it, it's come up on the scoreboard. And Marinus Kraus, believe it or not, by point one of a point, takes over from Severin Freund, who in turn is point one of a point ahead of Deschwanden, and Bardal is off the podium. So point two of a point separating the front three. Now, Kraft for Austria. Austria with Dietart and Schlierenza and of course Morgenstern to come, they're all in the top ten. And pulled off uh, Stefan Kraft, had this uh, burst of front wind and now it's turning every which way and strengthening over four metres per second. It's very staccato and turning around. If you've never come to a ski jumping competition, there are one or two I'd recommend. Obersdorf, because it's also a fantastic arena, but here in the Bergiesel, particularly with Austrian fortunes, it's ridiculously wonderful. So, Stefan Kraft, looking forward to going to Bishop's Open, but can he get a result here? to boost him, he can indeed, misery in Germany, much happier and now he's back in Austria. That is so much more like it. 126, now you again have to take into account that he had an advantage of almost a metre over Marinus Kraus. That would bring him up to the same distance. The front wind deduction is less. And that, for me, puts Kraft into number one. How special is this? You just look around if you're an Austrian. There he goes. You want to take this in, whether you win or not. Austria, take it back from Germany. Kraus to second, Freund to third, Deschwanden off the podium in fourth place and it's Germany to now try to counter-attack here Richard Freitag who little by little is getting back and su suggesting he's not far off his best just point one of a point separating him from Stefan Kraft they're both youngsters they're both real talents they've got years ahead of them but both are in a hurry Right, a uh, little bit of backwind coming for him. And it's over 120, but for my money, not sufficiently to trouble Kraft. 120 and a half. Now you have to take, in fact, the correction has just come up on the computer. He had, in fact, at the end of it all, some front wind. 
uh, but the distance is going to really be his undoing. And so, as we come towards the final 10, it's Austria in the lead from Germany, second, Germany third, Freitag down into sixth place, Deschwanden in fourth, and Bardal, the best of Norway, in fifth place. Well, the top ten now. One for Russia, two for Finland, three for Austria, one for Japan, one for Slovenia, one for Poland. And the next man up, you can see him, Denis Korninov, Alexander Arefiev, the Russian coach. Just a short pause first. And so here we go, Bergiesel 2014, Stefan Kraft, Austria, in the current leaders circle, and Kornilov, point one of a point ahead of the young Austrian. In fact, point two, not that it matters, Kornilov, and Kornilov just a little bit off balance, paddling, and oh, he was never quite in control. Now, is he okay? He's winded. RFEF looking down there, but he, he, he knows his man. I think he's okay. Yep, good to see. Disappointing finish to what I have to say was good fortune yesterday with the win and not so good fortune today. Really lost his balance, far too much weight on that left ski and no way to recover. You can see it's just a low one as he touches down. That's where the weight goes down. It's uneven and it gives him no chance of recovery. So as a result of this, of course, he loses 50% of his star marks and sadly for the Russians, he's going to tumble down. Yeah, just, he's, yeah, he's, he's okay physically, he's just tearful. Very few athletes get the opportunity to perform in front of an atmosphere like this. Yako Murta, what a good young Finnish athlete this young man has been. In his first Fier Shansen, 23rd in Oberstdorf, his personal best, 36 in Garmisch, didn't go so well, but now the 19-year-old, he's going to score some points. The question is, is how many? He's going after, of course, Stefan Kraft. He's only got point three of a point advantage. And by hook or by crook, we'll get through this, I believe. It will be a riot here if they stop this competition at the moment. Because Dieterhardt is the Austrian number one, and then surveying his kingdom, Walter Hofer. How long is it since we've seen two Finns in the top ten? And how amazing is it that one of them isn't Janne Ahonen? Janne Harponen, of course, at the moment, with mind and body in different places back home. Who knows whether we'll see him. Oli Harry, who uh, didn't make a great comeback into Continental Cup, and they're still short on resources. Sami Nimi who looked promising in the university ad, but has not managed to translate that form here into the Fier Shansen. <laughs> Afternoon, Jennifer. Glad you're enjoying the action here. Who wouldn't? And this is working out uh, in a very interesting way. Frank, I think you need a scotch. Uh, <laughs> it is one of those days for the Norwegians, but 
Alexander Stoeckel's got uh, quite a lot of work to do, and you can see that is a fantastic picture from Peter Bauman, the director. It just shows you just the strength and what it's doing to the furniture around the hill. Uh, Mark, up in Liverpool, you're asking about the relativity of uh, in-run speeds. What you've really got to do, Mark, is to relate them to their own personal performances. If you actually took their in-run speed uh, from qualification and then the first round and then the second round, then you can make the comparison as to what they're generating, as to what they might be losing and what they might be gaining. Uh, you can't really do that in a sort of general sense across the whole field. Those are the posh seats, or at least some of them. Modern facility, style judges on your left there, Miran on top. And, oh dear, no, they're not going to do this, are they? They might, I guess, take a pause. They can't pause too late here. We're already five past four, and they don't have any floodlights. Wind at the moment, backwind. What they're keen to do is to make sure that <clears throat> the final phase of this competition doesn't turn into a farce. Remember, we've had a lot of the men who are leading at the moment who've had advantageous front wind conditions. Kraft, Kraus, Freund, Deschwanden, Bardal, Freitag, Jakobsen, Matura, Muranka, and running the top 10 all with front wind conditions what they're concerned about is if suddenly the wind goes behind whether they have the possibility to make this any sort of a fair event i've seen this happen before there's thomas dietharts clan and right on the steps there at the heart of the action walter hofer Keine Top 10 beim Sepp. Keine Top 10. First round, final round cancelled. Keine Top 10. And Ansi Koivaranta has won his first World Cup competition. They have decided the jury. And you can see Walter Hofer in there. Oh, there's going to be a lot of chatter about this. Koivaranta wins, but Arman is the big winner because he is second, still hasn't won the Bergizel. Kamerstoff takes the bronze medal here. Schlierenzau is fourth. Dietart still takes a five-meter lead into uh, Bishopshoven. And Preuch and then Kasai. And they're quizzical, but don't be too down-hearted mum and dad of Thomas Dietard, because it could have been worse. There you have it. And that is the decision that the competition decided by the first round. And I thought by hook or by crook they'd be patient, but as I said, they don't have a lot of daylight, they don't have light, and the wind was really becoming very difficult to manage and what they didn't want to do was find themselves with the top 10 who had truly impossible conditions and that's what they've done what they've done it's a big anti-climax for the crowd and i guess for many of you at home but it takes some understanding So the Finns have come back to winning ways. Kammerstock in third place here. The best for Austria on the day, Gregor Schlierenzauer, followed by Thomas Dienhardt. The best for Slovenia, Peter Preuch. 
The best for Japan yet again, Noriaki Kasai. Morgan Stern finishes in eighth place. Yako Muratai of Finland, a personal best in ninth place. Well, it's been some competition, but it sets it up beautifully for Bishop Sovan. It'll be a case of getting down the hill, pack your bags, and on our way to Salzburger land. For myself, David Goldstrom, and Eurosports Nordic team, thanks for your company. See you in Bishop Sovan tomorrow. Well, it seems we've got a couple more moments here, so I don't know whether we're going to get a, a, a word with uh, Koi Varanta. What an occasion. I remember, you know, he was 10th in Garmisch. That was a big signpost, but I didn't expect perhaps him to come back and take the day. The wind at the moment uh, still fickle, and there you can see the Four Hills situation there. Thomas Dehart there by 10 points. That's a little over five and a half to six meters. Then 16 points to Morgan Stern. Now that's a bigger gap. That is going on nine meters. And Bishop Tobin isn't necessarily everybody's cup of tea. As you look further down the order, I can tell you in the World Cup standings, Camille Stock has just opened up the gap a little bit. Uh, with Seaman Oman over Schlierenzauer. So a rather silenced crowd now. They were really looking forward as much as we were. There's the World Cup points. But what we're really concerned about is the Four Hills. Dieter still in pole position. Five metres to the good over Oman. Ten ahead of Morgenstern. Then Kasai, then Preuch, but you're looking at really big gaps then. So once again, thank you for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you tomorrow for qualification in Bishop's Over.